This video is part of the Sharing Your Research workshop series for graduate students and early career researchers. Some examples will be targeted toward this group, but overall this video will provide a good, general introduction to open access. To start, let me introduce myself. My name is Chelsea Boley, and I'm the Scholarly Communication Librarian at Texas Women's University. I'm here as a resource and collaborator for the TWU community. I provide education training on open access and publishing, copyright consultations, and can help you with finding an open access journal or drafting a data management plan. If you're a student, faculty, or staff member of TWU, please do contact me with any questions regarding your academic publishing, open access, copyright, and data management plans. This talk and slides are licensed CC BY, which means you're permitted to reuse or remix this presentation as long as you provide me credit. So what is open access? Open access is a free, online, immediate availability of research articles, plus full reuse rights. This means that research articles are free to read and free to reuse. Both are important elements of open access. Often the full reuse rights take form in a Creative Commons license. Creative Commons licenses allow authors to retain their copyright, but communicate to others how their work can be used. The true definition of open access with full reuse rights would require CC BY license but many open access publishers utilize a variety of licenses or allow the author to choose what is best for them. To learn more about Creative Commons licenses, visit creativecommons.org or watch the next video in this series, Copyright and Your Rights. Open access being free to read is clearly a benefit for readers, but open access also has great benefits to you as a researcher. Since there is no charge to read open access research, your research is more discoverable. Studies have even shown that there is a potential higher citation count, which makes simple sense because if more people can access your research, the more potential readers who can cite your work. Open access publications also tend to have more rapid publication, so your research will spend less time waiting for publication. One of the greatest benefits to you as an author, though, is that you can keep your copyright. Many traditional publishers require a full transfer of copyright, but open access publishers typically allow you to retain your copyright, require only a license to publish, and often publish your work under a Creative Commons license. You also have the bonus benefit of helping research access for all. After all, as students and researchers, we've all been there, feeling the frustration of facing a paywall for a research article that our university doesn't subscribe to and that we cannot afford to pay ourselves. It slows down our research. Your field benefits by quicker progress when research is accessible. To illustrate, open access benefits you because it can increase your visibility. You can also get more funding. Increasingly, research funders are requiring your research to be publicly accessible, and by making your work openly accessible, you can benefit from being ahead of the game and being able to demonstrate wider impact with your research. Additionally, if you're a full-time faculty member and are interested in publishing in an open access journal, Texas Women's University has an open access publishing fund. Please view bit.ly slash TWOA fund for more information. You can reduce your publishing costs as well and publish where you want. You can still be an open researcher and maintain your current publishing practices if desired. Dr. Erin McKernan is a scientist and professor working in Mexico. She knows firsthand being denied access to research one needs, and as a result has become an open advocate and is the co-creator of whyopenresearch.org. In 2013, she tweeted, If publishing and open access journals cost me my career, then this is not the career I want, period. Dr. McKernan is a committed open researcher. Her statement has been criticized as career suicide, but her commitment reflects her personal values and why openresearch.org focuses on how being an open researcher can advance your career. Let's view an excerpt of her talk, Being Open as an Early Career Researcher at OpenCon 2014, where Dr. McKernan discusses her pledge to be open as an early career researcher and why open access matters. I have to ask myself, well, what is it that I can do uh, as an individual researcher to make sure that access is improved, that more people have access throughout the world. Well, quite simply, I can support open access. And so these are the personal pledges that I have made to be open. And I'll break this down one by one and why I've, I've committed to these things. So the first is to not edit, review, or work in any capacity for a closed access journal. I think it's really important that as an academic, if I'm going to devote my time, it be to journals and publishers that are improving the access situation and not the contrary. Okay? The second one is to blog my work and post preprints. And this idea is, is part of a bigger one to not just open access to that final published product, but to really open access to the entire scientific process. 
what am I doing when I'm coming up with a research question? How am I going through that process? Can I put it in language that other people outside my field can understand to increase access in that way as well? Um, third, I will publish only in open access journals. That by extension means that I won't publish in Cell, Nature, or Science. And um, <laughs> you can imagine the reaction to that in some, uh, some fields. Uh, and then finally, that I'll pull my name off a paper if my co-authors refuse to be open. So these are commitments that I've made personally. Um, and the reaction to this has been mixed. Some people have been very supportive of this, and other people have said, this is crazy. Uh, this is career suicide. Why are you risking yourself in this way? Um, I'd like to show you today that I don't think it has to be career suicide, that I think there are many, many ways in which you can be open with your work and still be extremely successful, and that in fact as an early career researcher, being open can help you build a name for yourself. Um, but even if I assume that there are risks involved in this position, it's really important to me that if I make it in science, however you define that, it be on terms that I can live with. And having seen that problem, I wouldn't live with locking up my research. Thank you. To watch the rest of her talk, visit the link below or click through at the end of the video. The biggest takeaway I want you to gain from this talk is that an open access, successful academic career is possible. Now, there are still concerns about open access journals, even for those that see the great benefits that open access offers, such as concerns over article processing charges or impact factor. Article processing charges, also known as APCs, are a different model of funding publication costs, and within science, a $3,000 APC is not uncommon. However, the majority of journals do not charge an APC. I can help you explore your options if this is a concern for you. The other primary concern is with impact factor. Many tenure-track researchers, or students like yourselves that want to gain a tenure-track position, fear that they will not gain a promotion or a job if they aren't publishing in high-impact factor journals. If this is a concern for you, you can still participate as an open researcher. If you're concerned that an open access journal does not have an impact factor, it is likely simply because it is a new journal and impact factor takes years to count. Let's go over a few open access myths that may help you with these concerns. The first is that publishing open access is the only open access. This isn't true. You can do open access in two ways, either by publishing in open access journals or archiving your research. Publishing open access is sometimes called gold open access, and archiving is called green open access. Archiving your research allows you to be an open researcher while maintaining your current publishing practices, which can help you if you need to meet expectations to publish or there are not yet open access journals in your research area. The second myth is that you're paying to publish. Open access is not vanity publishing. Open access is simply a different funding model. Publishing costs, whether money or in volunteer time. Their article processing charge business model shifts the cost from reader to the author or research funder. Rather than subscriptions that only give access to subscribers, open access gives access to all. If you need help covering the cost of an APC fee, you may be able to write it into a grant or get funding from the TWU Open Access Publishing Fund. If you're a full-time faculty member, you qualify for this funding. Unfortunately, at the present time, TWU students do not qualify for the Open Access Publishing Fund. But if you have co-authored with a faculty member, then you do qualify. Let me know if you have any questions regarding the Open Access Publishing Fund. The third myth is that all Open Access Journals charge fees. This isn't true either. According to the Directory of Open Access Journals, over 60% of Open Access Journals listed in their directory do not have an APC. And there are even new Open Access models developing. Launched in 2015, the Open Library Humanities is a new humanities publishing platform that does not charge subscription or any author-facing fees. The platform is instead funded by institution and library memberships. If you're a humanities researcher, I highly suggest that you check out the Open Library of Humanities at openlibhumes.org. The fourth myth is that open access journals are low in quality. Open access journals have the same standards of peer review, copyright, quality, prestige, and research impact. Unfortunately, there are some journals that are scams that give open access a bad reputation. If you are unsure if a journal is legitimate, verify it or contact me for help doing so. To find a suitable open access journal, you can browse the Directory of Open Access Journals at doaj.org or use the CoFactor Journal Selector tool. Mentors, colleagues, and librarians can also be a great resource for finding a suitable open access journal. If you decide that publishing open access is not right for you, or you've already published your research, you can go green by archiving your research. 
There are many great repositories, but the first two I'd recommend in general to students and early career researchers is TWU's Institutional Repository, the Pioneer Open Access Repository, and Figshare.com. Figshare can be a fantastic repository for graduate students, and you can include papers, dissertations, posters, data sets, and videos in Figshare. But before you archive, make sure you have the right to. Often publishers require full transfer of copyright, and you may not be allowed to archive your research. If you need help understanding your agreement or figuring out what archiving rights you have, get in touch. If you haven't published yet, negotiate your agreements so you can retain more of your copyright. Check out the next video workshop in the series, Copywriting Your Rights, for more information. For further information, TWU's Open Access Library Guide and whyopenresearch.org are great resources. Thank you for listening. There are three more videos in the Sharing Your Research workshop series, Copywriting Your Rights, Measuring Impact, and Research Data Management.